Hello, welcome. Uh, we see the attendees numbers trickling in, so give us just a moment as everyone uh, gets into the room and we'll get started. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, if you've just joined us, we're, we're giving just a moment for everyone to join the meeting room. So give us just a second and we'll get started. Okay, it looks like the number of attendees entering the room has slowed down a bit. So I'm going to uh, start the introduction, which will give folks uh, a little bit more time to join us while we're, we're doing the inaugural chit chat. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for joining us, everyone who is on the line. We're very excited to speak with you today. Uh, As again, our presentation is uh, PIPA for business owners, and this is coordinated through the Bermuda Cybersecurity Governance Board, which is a board that includes both government, private, and private sector uh, organizations, uh, all working to protect the critical cybersecurity infrastructure uh, for uh, Bermuda. So well, without further ado, uh, Dr. Stones, would you please advance to the next slide? Thanks. So here's our agenda for what we will speak about today. Uh, we'll, we'll start with an overview of what the Personal Information Protection Act is uh, and uh, describing some of the basics about privacy, because this can be an amorphous concept sometimes. And so we want to put a little bit of shape around that so you can understand what we're talking about. Uh, then we will uh, discuss what exactly a privacy program is. Uh, and, and Dr. Stones will take the lead on that as she is leading government's efforts to uh, implement the comprehensive privacy program. Uh, and then we'll have some Q&A. But we would encourage you to ask questions during the presentation. You can do so in the chat. Uh, and, and so that way we'll try to address your questions uh, mid-presentation. And uh, also, since I'll have to step away uh, before we're quite finished today, uh, and that way we, we can have a record of any questions and I can do follow-ups so, or you can reach out to my office. So happy to do that. Uh, all right, so let, let's get started. Oh yes, well, well here's us. Uh, I, I'm, I'm the one on the left. Uh, I'm the, the one on the right. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, the Office of the Privacy Commissioner is a public office, but we're an independent office uh, established by the Personal Information Protection Act and it's our job to interpret that act and set standards and help individuals uh, exercise their rights under that act. So as part of that, we do training sessions like these to help, help organizations uh, ensure that they are uh, implementing whatever uh, programs are necessary uh, to meet those rights and responsibilities. So Dr. Stones. Hi, I'm Dr. Marisa Stones. I am a senior information privacy analyst for within the uh, Patty Piper unit for the government of Bermuda within the uh, cabinet office. And uh, our unit is responsible for the Personal uh, Information Protection Act 2016 and also the Public Access to Information Act 2010. So um, while we are uh, responsible for the update of those pieces of legislation and uh, therefore also interacting with the Privacy Commissioner and the Information Qu Commissioner accordingly. We also uh, work uh, within the Government of Bermuda to help to ensure that um, uh, public officers are trained, that they also uh, have their regimes in place, and then also to um, help to provide uh, tools and guidance and facilitation as it relates to uh, carrying out the um, 
the responsibilities and uh, requirements of, of each of the acts. Additionally, as it relates to uh, the Personal Information Protection Act, we also will have uh, some responsibility for both the recognition of other privacy regimes from other jurisdictions, and then also uh, putting applications forward to other, um, other countries to have the Personal Information Protection Act uh, recognized as um, equivalent to their uh, respective privacy acts as well. And back to you, Alex. Terrific, thanks. Well, let's go to the next slide. We'll get started. So again, to start off, we'll talk a bit about the uh, Personal Information Protection Act and what privacy means. Uh, privacy can be uh, a bit of an amorphous term. As I said earlier, it means different things to different people. If you were to do an online search for you know, this phrase, what is privacy? You would probably come up with a lot of these uh, uh, quotes that you see on your screen now. And these are from a lot of different uh, legal thinkers or uh, treaties or uh, you know, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, things like that. They've come up with different ways of saying what privacy means, whether it's you know, the right to be left alone or uh, you know, respect for someone's private life, uh, protection against an intrusion. But here we're talking about uh, organizations that are typically small businesses. And uh, so what do these terms really mean when you think about a small business? That it can be tough to put that into context for your actual work. What does it mean you're actually supposed to do when you sit at your desk? So I, I like to use this definition for privacy, uh, which is that privacy is about the management of information that relates to an individual. And the reason I love that definition so much is we're tying things back to the individual. So we're thinking about a specific person and specific information that relates to that person uh, and also how we are communicating with that person, what that person understands about uh, our, our business processes. So everything ties back to a specific individual that you're trying to communicate with, a customer perhaps, or an employee, uh, but someone that, that you're speaking to and, and wanting to have that genuine relationship and genuine conversation with. Uh, but it's an even more fundamental question. Businesses might say, why do we even have to do this? Is this really something that uh, we should be getting involved in? And the answer is yes, because uh, we have to give individuals the ability to control what happens to their information. And more and more nowadays, uh, there are what, what I'll call third parties getting involved in how individuals use their information. So a, a really easy example is if you think about your cell phone, your mobile phone, and, uh, and when you are sharing information, uh, say you're sending a message from you know, one partner to another uh, at, you know, in the home. And, uh, and so even just set, you know, what used to be perhaps a secret conversation that you would just whisper to that person, now the cell phone app that you're using is potentially accessing that message. The, uh, your, your carrier knows that you have sent message, a message from phone number X to phone number Y. Uh, perhaps the manufacturer of the phone made a backup of that message and is storing it on their servers. So all of a sudden we've got more and more people involved in privacy. So we needed a framework for how we, ha how we treat those uh, situations and how organizations have to respond in those situations. So we were to put it in basically three high-level rules, you know, setting aside all of the details of PIPA, which we will get into. But if you just needed three high-level rules to help you conceptualize what we're talking about, it's, it's these three on your screen right now. So you want to give people information about what's happening and how you're going to use the data. So it, it, for a small business, it could be you're using it for payment processing for a credit card. It could be that you are using it for a mailing list so that you can notify them about new products. There could be different ways that you're using the information. So you wanna make sure people understand what those uses are uh, so that they can make an informed choice. And, and that's to make sure they can give you a clear way of saying exactly what they want to happen. Yes, sign me up for that mailing list. 
yes, you know, you can, whether it's, you know, run my card through the machine, whether it's write down my credit card process uh, in a different way, whatever the case may be, you want to explain it to them and they give you a clear choice, a clear answer to the, the choice about what happens. And, and that can be tricky because sometimes uh, it, it's easy to assume, uh, but people can make different assumptions. And so you want to make sure that choice is very clear. Uh, and lastly, keep promises that you make. And, and that can sound very simple, but it can be tough sometimes. You know, maybe you have a mailing list about new products and then you think, oh, you know, I'm sure that my customers would be really interested in this product that my cousin is doing, uh, and uh, but that's not what they signed up for. And, and so you have to make sure you're sticking to those promises that you make, unless you go back and get additional permissions, et cetera, et cetera which we'll talk about how that works. But let's go to the next slide. So again, those, those were the three kind of high level, what does privacy mean? Uh, here we're getting into a little bit more of the weeds of what does PIPA say? So here, here's what the law says specifically. And organizations are responsible for putting uh, policies and procedures, for putting together uh, you know, uh, compliance programs, whatever the case may be, in order to uh, make sure that they are meeting these requirements. And, and we'll talk about how exactly to do that in, in just a moment, because we're, our second half of our presentation is all about what kind of a privacy program would help you uh, accomplish these things. But for now, I just want to give you a rundown at a very high level of what these requirements are. Uh, so PIPA has a, a set of what's called minimum requirements, which all organizations have to comply with, even uh, an organization that may be exempted from other uh, aspects. So, you know, if you think about something like national security or, or something like that, that, everyone has to still meet the minimum requirements, even if there is another exemption. So what are those minimum requirements? Uh, you have to take responsibility uh, for uh, what happens to the information and for compliance with PIPA. You have to make sure you are implementing the program appropriately that you have designated who in your organization is responsible, what we will often call a privacy officer in our next session. Next up is the idea of fairness. And an easy way to think about this is uh, making sure that you are not doing something that is against the individual's interest. So if you were doing something that you knew was going to cost a customer money and not give them anything, that could be an inherently unfair use personal information. Proportionality. Uh, this is the idea that you only collect the information that is needed to accomplish whatever purpose you're trying to accomplish. Uh, and, and it's a great way to think about how your business operations work. You know, when you have an intake form, a customer intake form, and there are all these fields for a customer to fill out, do you need every single one of those fields in order to do whatever it is the customer is asking? Uh, that's a, it's a great test to see if you're meeting the, the proportionality requirement. Uh, integrity means making sure that the information is accurate, complete, and up to date for the purpose that you're trying to accomplish. And, and so you, you have to, by, by its very nature, you have to think about, well, what purpose are we trying to accomplish? Is it, like I said, the mailing list? Is it to uh, deliver a product? You know, a customer wants home delivery, so you have to take down their home address. That's the purpose you're trying to accomplish. But everything centers around the, the actual purpose you're trying to accomplish, because what's the minimum amount of data necessary for that purpose? How do you keep the, the information uh, accurate for that purpose? And, and sometimes you only will need a, a certain level of specificity. You know, if you need to make sure that someone is older than the age of 21 in order to access your product, you may not need their month, day, and year of their birth. You know, just their year of birth might be enough. Uh, and and uh, whereas uh, when it comes to uh, certain factors that they may change over time. So uh, for example, at the doctor's office, you might have to provide your weight. And that's something that can certainly change from time to time. And so uh, from a data integrity perspective, it has to be checked and evaluated over time. Uh, and lastly, from the minimum requirements is uh, the idea of security. 
And this is the requirement to implement uh, safeguards that protect the information from loss or misuse. And, and that is a, a, a whole field in and of itself. And uh, you can often work closely with information security professionals. And we'll, again, we'll talk a little bit more about what that program actually means. But from a high level perspective, it simply means you have to think about what could go wrong. You know, could the information be used for identity theft? Could the information be used by a stalker to harass someone? Uh, you know, could the information be used uh, in a way that would embarrass someone? You know, whatever those harms might be and implement controls that are appropriate. So it could mean locking up your filing cabinet. It could mean um, having a password on your computer, all that good stuff. So it, it will depend on the circumstances. Next up, there are some additional requirements that uh, organizations have to meet, and this is additional to the minimum requirements. So again, most organizations are going to have to meet these requirements as well, but some organizations are exempt from the additional requirements, but most small businesses will have to meet these requirements as well. Uh, so first up is the purpose limitation. This is the idea that once you've established a purpose for uh, the reason why you're using the data, um, that you, and you've communicated that purpose to the individual, perhaps you've gotten their consent for that purpose, uh, you can only use it for that purpose. And that can be a very uh, tricky thing sometimes because again, it can be tempting, you could think of new ideas that you hadn't thought about before, uh, in which case PIPA does allow you to go back to the individual and get another consent or if there may be some other exception why you can use information for uh, an additional purpose. Uh, but it, you can't do that by default. There has to be, uh, you have to meet that ob obligation in order to use it for an additional purpose. The conditions for using personal information. In, in many ways, PIPA is not a tick the box exercise because it has to be custom for every organization. It will all depend on what your purpose is and what you're trying to accomplish. But uh, for this one item, it is a bit of a tick the box exercise because you have to pick out one of these conditions as your basis for using personal information. So this could mean I have the consent, and when I say I, I mean the business owner or the organization. So I have the consent of the individual. I need to use this information in order to fulfill this contract that I have. I'm required by law to collect this information. You have to tick one of these boxes uh, as, as part of your, uh, you know, a basis for even having the information in the first place. Uh, privacy notices. Now, I talked a little bit about this already because I said you have to express to inf individuals what's happening to their information. You have to tell them about the purpose. Well, PIPA has some specific items like that that have to be expressed in a privacy notice. And, and there are, there's a list, uh, uh, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. The idea behind it is that uh, you, you're giving information to individuals so that they are aware of what's happening. And the form that that takes could be a lot of different things. A lot of people immediately think of a website privacy notice, uh, but that may or may not be the best way to provide notice to your customers or to your employees or whoever it is you're trying to provide notice to. So you might be better off handing out pieces of paper. It, it could just depend on what's appropriate in your circumstances. Uh, sensitive personal information. PIPA has a specific definition for sensitive personal information. And the main implications of this, well, let me tell you what it means first. So, so sensitive personal information is things like uh, health information, political information, uh, or political affiliations, place of origin, um, race, sexual orientation, those sorts of details. Uh, it, things that are by their very nature could be used to discriminate against an individual. Uh, and so the reason why those are highlighted in PIPA is because uh, one, you have to treat them at a higher level of security. So going back to the security safeguards we talked about a second ago, if you have personal information, you have to consider that at a higher level of security. And secondly, sometimes the conditions for using personal information are restricted uh, when it comes to sensitive personal information. Uh, so the the one of the examples of a condition is you know a reasonable person would not object to me using this information. Well, 
what we say in PIPA is that sensitive information is so important and so potentially dangerous that you can't just assume that they wouldn't object. That's not allowed. And all of this is explained in PIPA, and we can go into more details if you have questions about that. Uh, lastly, personal information about children. This is the idea that uh, if you are providing an online service to children, uh, so this could be an app, or uh, you know, this could be a website, something like that, uh, then there are some specific requirements about getting the consent of the parent and not asking the child certain things, you know, hey, tell me about what your mommy and daddy do for their job, you know, because people could use that for advertising or what have you. Um, but this is not a blanket rule. So this is not saying that, uh, you know, if you were a uh, daycare provider, and uh, and you are you're you're keeping records on children uh, the children in your care uh, that you might have to follow these because that wouldn't be an information society service which is the defined term in there so anyway if you have more questions about that if that might apply to you you can reach back out to our office or you can ask some questions in the chat but I won't belabor that just so we can get through everything so so let's move on to our next slide. Ah, yes. The next slide is on individual rights. So far, what we've talked about are what uh, obligations an organization has to meet. Uh, but here we're turning to uh, the rights that individuals have under PIPA. And a, a good way to think about this is that uh, essentially, instead of creating a one regulator in the Privacy Commissioner's Office, uh, PIPA really empowered 60,000 regulators because it gave every individual to, uh, the ability to go to an organization and say, do you have personal information about me? And the organization has to answer and say either yes or no, and, or provide that information. So that's the ability to access. Uh, so at, a, at the very least, you should be able to, if, you, if you're an organization that falls under PIPA, you, you should be able to answer that question. Uh, do you have personal information about a person who's asking for it? Uh, the, the next right is rectification. This is a fancy way of saying correcting the data. Uh, so if, for example, your records were incorrect and a birthday was wrong or something like that, an individual has the right to get that information corrected. And that can be very important if you think about things like uh, uh, credit report or something like that, you know, incorrect information can have very significant uh, consequences for an individual. So an individual has the ability to block the use of their personal information for marketing purposes. And this is perhaps the strongest of the rights. So if, if the information is being used a strict, just for marketing, and that's the, the purpose for, for the, uh, using the personal information, then an individual has a pretty strong right to, to simply block uh, that use. Uh, so please note that. Uh, and then lastly, in some cases, not all cases, uh, there's the ability to request erasure or destruction of information. So what this means is if you had a purpose for why you collected the data, let's say a customer purchased an item from you and wanted home delivery, you noted their home address uh, and then delivered the product. So your purpose for having that home address is, is finished, it's completed then perhaps they would want to request you erase that information so it's not lying around in your filing cabinet or in your computer banks, and then you would uh, erase that. Now that said, there are plenty of reasons why you might need to retain information. So this could be for financial reporting or record keeping or transactions or, or things like that. So the right to erasure is not absolute, uh, and that's a, a common misunderstanding. Uh, but if you have any questions about that, please reach out to my office and we can talk more about that. But essentially it means if the purpose has run its course, if there's no longer a reason for you to retain information, why not get rid of it? Because then you're getting rid of the risk, getting rid of the chance of a data breach. Okay, well, so, so I'll turn things over now to Dr. Stones who can talk about her efforts. Uh, uh, creating a privacy program and uh, some of other best practices. But again, please post some uh, uh, any questions you have in the chat. Uh, unfortunately, and I apologize for this, I'll have to duck out about halfway through Dr. Stone's presentation. 
Uh, but I'll, I'll be happy to uh, follow up with anyone. You can visit our website, privacy.vm, if you want to learn more about our office. So thanks so much. Over to you, Dr. Stones. Thank you so very much, Privacy Commissioner. I, I truly appreciate it. Well, um, we have, ha have had an overview of what is contained within the Personal Information Protection Act. And uh, the question uh, that most people have next is, well, what am I supposed to do with that, that information? How do I actually uh, make sure that I am complying with the, with the act? And uh, what most organizations uh, try to do is put a privacy program in place. And the wonderful thing about both the Personal Information Protection Act and indeed the development of your privacy program is that you'll see that um, the, the act does not is not very prescriptive. It doesn't say you must do this, this, and this in order to meet this requirement. There are a few areas that will say that you need to provide certain information. However, the form in which you provide it, the way in which you have to meet that requirement, um, there is a flexibility that allows a smaller business uh, to do what they need to do because they are dealing with less information and a larger organization may have to do uh, something more which may require that they may engage a third party or something to help them with the development of their privacy program. Now, before I start talking about, um, you know, a way in which you can operationalize um, the Personal Information Protection Act in the development of your program. Um, I do want to say that this whole section is developed from guidance that the Privacy Commissioner's Office um, has published. Uh, if you go to the Privacy Commissioner's website, uh, which is privacy.bm, there is a section in which the Privacy Commissioner does provide guidance on various areas of the Personal Information Protection Act. and. Uh, he has provided this document on what are the components of a privacy program to help organizations to be able to develop their programs. So uh, the full document is available on that website and uh, it goes into much more detail than, than I, I will cover this afternoon. So if I were to create a checklist, and I know that the Privacy Commissioner did say in, in his component that, you know, PIPA is not a checklist exercise, but I do want to everyone to realize that there are elements within the Personal Information Protection Act that we must comply. How you comply is the, um, is the flexible piece, and uh, the degree to which you comply will, may depend on uh, the industry that you're working within, the amount of personal information that you deal with, um, you know, the size of your organization, the number of vendors or third parties that you work with. So even though, you know, it isn't, I check a box and that means that I've, I've you know, this is done, um, how you do it um, is the area in which there is flexibility. So w the first piece, I have the privacy officer at the top of this, this privacy program checklist. Um, it is not contained in the privacy program guidance document that you will find on the Privacy Commissioner's website because he has released separate guidance related to privacy officers. And there have been a lot of questions about privacy officers over the, the last uh, few months. Uh, indeed, even within the government of Bermuda, we have been asking questions related to, well, what will a privacy officer look like for, um, for the government? The way in which a privacy officer will um, operate within a small or medium-sized business versus a reinsurance company, versus a charity, versus a doctor's office, versus a government department will vary, again, according to what it is the organization does and the amount of information that they're dealing with. Indeed, a privacy officer can even be outsourced to a third-party firm. However, that privacy officer is responsible for developing the organization's privacy program and then also for communicating with the office of the privacy officer, uh, privacy commissioner, sorry, and the public. So at the very highest level, the privacy officer is the person putting together this program to ensure that 
the organization complies with PIPA, and then also, when required, communicating with the Office of the Privacy Commissioner, usually in the a situation that involves a, a, a data breach, but we will discuss that a little bit later, and then the public, and that usually will be uh, in the form of providing information related to the privacy notice. The inventory is usually the first step for the privacy program. And by inventory, I mean, um, you know, going through the information that the organization currently collects and classifying or mapping that information to identify what personal information is actually used um, in the operations of the organization. Policies and procedures get into actually documenting uh, the organization's personal information use practices and ensuring that that information is documented. So if there are any issues, there's the ability to point to documentation as to what we do and why we do it. And that becomes very information to provide your due diligence, showing that you've done due diligence um, as it relates to identifying risks and, um, and protecting uh, individuals' personal information. Training and awareness, um, you are participating in, in training right now um, and helping to uh, raise awareness uh, in relationship to uh, the Personal Information Protection Act and privacy rights in Bermuda. But it becomes important that the organization does provide appropriate training and awareness to its staff and then others who may access the data. So it may require that a vendor that you work very closely with also um, take the participate in the training that the staff take uh, participate in to ensure that they know the requirements under um, under PIPA. Privacy risk. This is an area I believe that has caused the greatest uh, amount of questions and concerns uh, in my interactions um, uh, within uh, the government, but also in, in conversations and discussions um, over the last couple of um, months with doing presentations in the community, um, because it is important to analyze the privacy risk in the context of how the organization uses that information. And then they may also use tools such as a privacy impact assessment to be able to identify what those risks are. And then upon the identification of those risks, you know, what can be done to, to fix those risks, to, to lessen those risks to the individual and to you know, protect that personal information. And uh, that is an area, don't worry, we will discuss in a bit more detail. Incidents, this is the piece that probably gets the, the, the most attention in the news media uh, around the world uh, because of the, the, uh, just the effect that it has been having on, you know, not just uh, organizations, but on individuals. I mean, we, we saw that there were some major security breaches in the U.S. Um, over the last couple of months to which, you know, we, we saw a, a, an actual pipeline having to be shut down and people, you know, rushing to gas stations because of, um, of a security incident, uh, of, you know, a system being hacked. And um, it therefore becomes very important for an organization to have an action plan in place, an incident response plan in place, to respond to incidents or indeed potential breaches um, to the security of the organization. And then finally, um, on the checklist is the rights request, uh, developing procedures to be able to respond to an individual's request to see their personal information or to correct that information or to not have uh, marketing material sent to them and such. So that is just a sort of like an overview of what the checklist. Um, indeed, many of these items refer to individual sections of the Personal Information Protection Act, but um, what we hope we can do today is break down some of these so you can see the types of things that should be included in your privacy program um, as you work towards planning um, your preparations to be able to comply with um, PIPA. 
So the first area is the privacy officer. And again, there is indeed a whole document um, on privacy officer guidance on privacy.bm. So as I said previously, the privacy officer is responsible for ensuring that um, the organization puts together the, um, the actual privacy program. So this is important because they need to have appropriate measures in place um, and policies in place so that individuals are able to realize their rights under, under PIPA. So that gives them the ability to have more control over their information and what is done with their information. So, you know, by ensuring that these policies in place uh, are in place, you know, as it relates to communicating to them in advance before you do anything with their information, um, ensuring that, um, you know, security is in place um, at a level that is, you know, commensurate with uh, the risk to their personal information and the type of personal information that they do provide to you. Um, you are able to ensure that you know the rights of the individual are respected under PIPA. And the privacy officer is responsible for ensuring that the um, organization develops these measures, whether in a larger organization, they are the ones that may you know coordinate or um, or indeed create uh, these um, policies and procedures and such. Um, you know, that the privacy officer is the one who is accountable um, according to um, uh, the way uh, that the organization is going to um, operationalize their privacy program. Their contact information would be listed in privacy notices so that the they would be um, available to respond to any questions from individuals or indeed request to exercise PIPA rights. Now, that does not necessarily mean that um, the privacy officer is the person who is going to provide that individual with personal information. They may be the one who can direct the individual to um, the receptionist or, or someone else who has been trained to be able to um, meet the requirements of, of the the um, individual access request. Uh, so, you know, it may be the type of thing where the privacy, somebody wishes to correct information and the privacy officer says, you know, go to this website to be able to provide the information or uh, go to the receptionist and the receptionist will be able to collect that information and, um, you know, provide you with your information to for you to review and then identify what needs to be corrected. So yes, um, responsibilities can be delegated to others within the organization, but ultimately the privacy officer is the one that is um, ensuring that those um, responsibilities are carried out within the organization. And then ultimately they are responsible for compliance. So you know, even though there are others that may have a role to play, they are the ones that are ensuring that um, everything is being done according to the requirements of the Personal Information Protection Act. Now, as I said yeah, previously, the inventory may actually be the area that most organizations will get started. Um, and the best place to start is at the beginning. and the beginning is, well, what exactly do you hold in your organization? What type of personal information? How much personal information do you hold? Um, it is very difficult to, you know, put a program in place, put tools in place if you don't know what you have in the first place. And, you know, you know, how do you need to protect that information? So the very beginning often starts with uh, doing a personal information inventory. So the recommendations that are made within the guidance from the Privacy Commissioner's Office is to include the details. What type of data is this data that you're collecting? Is it health data? Is it financial? Is it educational? You know, actually categorize that information so you know 
um, you know, what category that it falls into and how it's being used. You may decide that you want to, you know, get into more specific subcategories so that you are also identifying where uh, sensitive personal information is being used as well. Um, you know, getting into gender and um, race and sex and things like that. And then you also want to identify those individual data elements that are going to, um, you know, may affect an individual, such as things like their health insurance number or their credit score or their grade point average, you know, those types of data elements that, you know, can refer refer back to an individual or the type of information that, um, you know, they may actually, uh, some may actually use to, do, to help to identify them. So once you actually understand what you have and, you know, start to actually classify that information, the next step is to track the flow of that information within the organization. And the Privacy Commissioner provides a, an excellent example in the guidance documentation that, um, that I have provided here in, uh, for our presentation. So, you know, say for example, you are in a doctor's office. So uh, there is a paper intake form that the receptionist hands over to you because you wish to start going to this particular doctor's office. You fill out the information on the paper, hand it back to the receptionist. So the process then uh, proceeds as follows. The receptionist may then scan the paper to create an electronic copy. And then additionally, there she will he or she will store the paper version in a particular filing cabinet. The electronic version that has been scanned is saved in a particular computer hard drive or because of the fact that we, we do see this more and more nowadays, it may be stored to a cloud storage drive that is not located in Bermuda. And, you know, it becomes very important to think about that flow of that information and where it ends up resting, whether it be in that physical file cabinet or that computer hard drive, or you know perhaps a cloud storage facility um, you know that's located somewhere else in the world, and that is the that is as I said the start of this um, this privacy program process, understanding what you have and what you do with it. We then get into policies and procedures, and um, you know there are quite a few things that we can discuss related to policies and procedures. I'm going to um, hit upon a, a few high-level elements, some of which have been discussed already by, or mentioned already by the Privacy Commissioner, but I want to summarize this as document how you intend to use personal information within your organization. So what type of policies might we be talking about? Well, the key pieces are some of the elements that the, the Privacy Commissioner mentioned, as I said. Um, you know, what is the purpose um, to be accomplished that you are collecting this information for? And that purpose may be, uh, you know, to be able to, um, you know, offer this particular service or to be able to, um, you know, carry out a particular requirement that requires that personal information. Um, as the, the commissioner mentioned, the conditions for use under PIPA Section 6, um, you know, whether it be consent, legal obligation, um, you know, what have you, you know, what what is the, the reason why you have the ability to use the, the personal information that is provided to you? And, you know, making sure that that is um, identified and able to be communicated. The type of, of data to be collected and used, uh, you know, that's identifying, you know, those, those categories that we talked about during the, the inventory. Um, and then, of course, you know, having appropriate standards of protection in place. So those that, that may be your security policy, your security plan, um, you know, and, and other elements. So, you know, many of these policies, you probably already have some of them, um, you know, in place to some degree. There may be other areas in which you do need to um, add additional information. Something that is new uh, within uh, the Personal Information Protection Act is the requirement for privacy notice. 
and um, you know there may be some terminology confusion uh, when we say privacy notice because um, if you look at it from a U.S. perspective, a lot of people consider a privacy policy uh, to be a privacy notice, but indeed a privacy policy is something that is a little bit different uh, as it relates to uh, you know privacy legislation and such um, in in actual practice. Now, a privacy notice is focused towards your, your customers, uh, the individuals who use your service. And under PIPA, there are requirements related to uh, the issuance of this privacy notice, um, both in what needs to be contained within it and when it needs to be presented to the individual. So a privacy notice, um, basically talks to personal information that is going to be used. So this is the information that we are going to um, uh, request from you. Uh, the purposes for which this information is going to be used or might be used, you know, it is going to be used to develop, uh, to provide this particular product or service to you. Um, you identify the types of individuals or organizations that the personal information might be disclosed. So there may be other partners that need to receive this information. There may be another organization that need to receive this information in order to um, fulfill the, the service or the product that you have. Or indeed, it may be that you are saving this personal information on a server of uh, you know, Amazon Web Services or something like that overseas, and they need to know that, you know, it will be, um, you know, stored on a third party uh, web server. Um, the identity and the location of the organization, including information on how to contact it about the handling of personal information. And this is very important because, interestingly enough, there are many organizations do, that do not provide contact details, you know, how to get in contact with them. So uh, this is a, a key piece and um, that most organizations need to look at and, you know, see whether you are providing enough information uh, to customers on how you can be contacted um, and, you know, the ability to um, for them to um, ask questions about the handling of their personal information. Now, currently the legislation says that the name of the privacy officer has to be um, included in the privacy notice. We are in the midst of um, going through a harmonization process uh, for the uh, update of the Personal Information Protection Act. And uh, we will actually be changing that to the contact information of the privacy officer, understanding that um, you know, the, it's uh, it may be you know a, 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 there are a number of people who may be providing this um, this uh, uh, particular responsibility with an organization, or indeed um, you know it may be handled by a third party. So you know we will be updating that information accordingly. And then finally, um, remember we are talking about you know the provision of their privacy rights. So you know information relating to how the individual um, can um, you know have access to uh, to correct their information uh, to be able to um, you know basically carry out their rights as it relates to. Um, you know, the, the, their personal information. Um, for some people that may be providing, you know, a mechanism of, you know, this is the way in which you can get in contact with us and the process uh, that you might follow to, um, you know, to request your information. And for other organizations, it may be even something to the degree of access to a customer portal in which they're able to update their own information. So, you know, the, the, the way in which that that portion of uh, providing people the ability to, um, you know, um, have uh, the ability to carry out their privacy rights, uh, you know, may vary, but it is communicated within the privacy notice. Now, I said that there is a bit of a difference between privacy notice and a privacy policy. A privacy policy, um, you 
you will find often is the policy within the organization that um, the organization follows uh, to meet um, you know, privacy compliance and such. So it is actually a organizational policy, not, um, you know, not a website notice, uh, the way in which we, we generally see it on, on many US websites. So, you know, a privacy notice is the um, communication of how we're dealing with a person's personal information to the customer. A privacy policy is an internal uh, policy document as to how we deal with um, meeting our privacy um, compliance requirements. And then finally, uh, in policies and procedures, I do want to talk about employee documentation because uh, our employees, in many cases, are the ones that are expected to carry out um, these requirements in their day-to-day -day operations. Indeed, we're, we're talking about not just a privacy program, but we're talking about, you know, probably, uh, you know, a whole change in culture uh, for organizations that don't already have a very customer-centric environment. So employees need to know what they have to do um, uh, as it relates to who has access to personal information, what do we need to do with personal information, um, when we need personal information, what do we need to think about um, before we actually, you know, ask for it and such. And then, what, of course, what happens if somebody comes and says, I want to see the information that you have on me, and I want to correct this information because it's wrong. So it becomes very important that there is documentation for employees as to what they need to do to meet the privacy requirements. Training and awareness. Um, this is an area that we have seen develop and uh, will continue to grow within our community uh, in the coming months and years as uh, more and more Bermuda organizations, um, you know, start to develop, um, you know, training that is specific to the Personal Information Protection Act. That said, uh, there is a great deal of privacy and awareness training uh, that is taking place globally because um, if you've noticed, there have been many, uh, the passage of many pieces of uh, privacy and data protection legislation um, in, in recent years. So I've broken it down into um, two main areas. Um, first is general awareness training, and uh, this is the the training that you know really needs to be uh, needs to take place for everyone within an organization. It's often something that may take place on an annual basis. For example, uh, some organizations may do it quarterly, depending on how much personal information that they're deal with, dealing with and how much risk they think that they may have because of the the um, amount and the sensitivity of personal information that they collect. Um, it is training that covers the basics as it relates to personal information and um, information risk. And then it also helps an organization to think about and identify what their privacy risks are. And the reason why at a general awareness training perspective, it becomes important is because, you know, your people who are on the front, front line, your people who are answering the phones, your people who are interacting with, with customers, they may be able to spot problems in the course of their work. And, you know, in identifying those problems, you're able to move quickly to be able to rectify the situation, protect that personal information, uh, protect those um, customer uh, and individual rights. And then we start getting into role specific training. And this is an area where, you know, more specialized training may be required um, because a, an individual's um, specific tasks within an organization requires that they deal with personal information on a regular basis. And it is, you know, they need to ensure that they are doing um, their job in a way in which the personal information is protected and it is not put at risk. So a couple of examples that have been provided, uh, there may be different training for human resources personnel versus sales personnel because that human resources personnel um, is probably dealing with an awful lot 
of sensitive personal information of the individual who is applying for that job and um, and then needs to know what to be able to do, what questions they're able to ask, what information they're able to request, and then of course, what are they supposed to do with the information once a hiring decision has been made. And that differs from what a sales personnel um, access to um, sensitive personal information may be. They may not have access to any sensitive personal information in the sales process, save a person's um, name and possibly their address. And then of course, you know, the difference of training for a cashier who is, you know, dealing with a, a person who is, you know, directly in front of them and the type of information that they may be dealing with versus a general manager who may have a greater depth of information and maybe using and processing the information in a different way. They may require different information because of the type of things that they're doing. And then of course, for your person, uh, individual who is acting as your privacy officer, they may again require totally different level of training because of course, they are ensuring that the organization it has to comply with the Personal Information Protection Act. So they may have um, additional areas in which they need to understand and be able to guide other individuals within the organization through. So I just say at the bottom that uh, you know this type of training it may vary in frequency or intensity according to the type of personal information that is used by the organization and the risks. So a doctor's office may have um, you know a different need for frequency and uh, depth of information versus you know an, an online store that. Uh, you know, may may sell T-shirts and things like that. So, you know, it's it's a matter of understanding what you're doing and why you're you're doing it, and then identifying the the level of training that is going to be required because of the information, personal information that the organization processes. Privacy risks, um, again, very important, and this is the area in which uh, there have been a lot of questions over the last couple of months. So um, broken it down into three areas. The first is context, um, you know, looking at the risks that uh, may be identified in the specific context of, you know, where that information is going to be used and, you know, what it can do, you know, what harms can come to an individual if something goes wrong. So many organizations will use a tool called a privacy impact assessment. And a privacy impact assessment allows the organization to walk through a particular business process to identify any risks. Um, they can also identify what controls need to be in place. And an example of a control may be something like an access control. You don't want everybody to have um, access to your customer database. So you may put a, um, a special password on that system that um, you know only individuals should that should be in that particular system uh, therefore can have access to that customer database versus anyone in the organization who has access to the computer and then identify when um, information is shared with other organizations because according to to pipa the organization um, is still responsible for that information, even if it is being transferred to that third party, whether it be for storage or, or for additional processing. And then what contractual mechanisms or other protections may be needed? Does there need to be a data sharing agreement in place with other organizations? Do there need to be you know, more strenuous um, um, security verbiage in a contract with a third party vendor or something like that? Um, and uh, that privacy impact assessment will flag those risks that then allows the organization to say, what do I need to do to reduce the risk, both for my organization and then of course for the individual. So the organization can then identify controls to be put in place to, to uh, mitigate those risks. And those controls will vary based on the type of personal information that the organization is trying to protect and the identification of what actions may be reasonable. I mean, it may be, um, you know, just entirely too onerous or too expensive 
for, um, for some risk mitigations. And in that case, the organization may then want to, uh, you know, say that they are going to put these controls in place and they are willing to accept, you know, the remaining risk uh, because of the fact that, you know, it, it's, um, you know, too costly to be able to, you know, encrypt the entire database or, or something like that. And then give special consideration to risks involved with sensitive personal information because remember, uh, that sensitive personal information can create, um, you know, additional harms to individuals and, and it becomes very important to, uh, you know, do what can be done to, to protect that sensitive personal information. Indeed, there is a guidance document on the Privacy Commissioner's uh, website on harms. So, um, you know, there's, there's also the benefit to um, reading that guidance as well. Incidents. Again, this is the area that seems to get the most press. Uh, it's the area that um, scares most organizations, and it is an area that is shared with security because, um, you know, we are all very, very concerned about the amount of information that we do provide to organizations and, you know, what happens to our information if somebody were to, um, you know, hack into, uh, you know, a, a Target or a Home Depot or, uh, you know, uh, an Experian or whomever and get, uh, you know, our personal information and then have the ability to, you know, basically uh, steal our, our identity or something like that. You know, we're reading about this on a, you know, almost a weekly basis nowadays. So, you know, it becomes very important to, um, you know, have a plan in place to deal with incidents. So, but remember, incidents could just include mistakes when sharing personal information. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, some hacker, uh, you know, getting into our system and stealing a whole database. It may be something as simple as I'm storing information on a USB storage device and I lose it. You know, that is a, a security incident. Or uh, I'm having a conversation with a customer and they are able to read everything that is on my screen because I, you know, have my computer set up in such a way in the office where, you know, they can see everything if they just literally stand at the front desk. You know, that is the possibility of, um, you know, somebody, you know, um, getting personal information that they shouldn't have access to. So, you know, there is a continuum indeed and uh you know an awful lot of what we may be dealing with may be you know just making sure that we have a plan in place to ensure that you know this the the smaller mistakes don't happen but then we also have um you know things in place to prevent or at least slow down as much as possible those the possibility of the larger uh security breaches so what should be involved in these action plans or these uh incident response plans well um important is who to notify within the organization if something happens um who will make the decisions within the organization if there is an incident who, who is going to, um, you know, make sure that, you know, we, we start that, that response, we, we start moving through that action plan. Identify any vendors who will assist with uh, security breaches. And, and uh, you see here, it says before the actual breach occurs so that you actually know who to contact and you can contact, contact them immediately as soon as you find out. Um, that there has been a breach of security so that you can minimize, you know, any damage that um, may be taking place. Now, there are requirements for uh, security breaches within uh, the Personal Information Protection Act, and it involves the privacy officer. So this is the communication with the privacy commissioner's office that um, we, you know, we, we are very clear about as it relates to, to the act. I mean, granted, you know, I think it is still very important as well to, to for privacy officers to have the ability to develop a relationship with the privacy commissioner's office as well, because, you know, they may be communicating related to international transfers of information and such, but this is probably the, the most critical one. So the privacy officer will be required to notify 
the Office of the Privacy Commissioner, and any individual affected if personal information is lost during uh, or compromised uh, during a security incident. And um, what that means is that, you know, the, the privacy officer in the organization may want to, you know, basically template, um, you know, that incident response process so that if something does happen, you know, what are, what are the communications going to look like, you know, to send to the privacy commissioner's office to, um, you know, send to individuals that are affected um, that, you know, there are already lists of contacts in place on, you know, if this happens, you know, we need to get in contact with these individuals, um, you know, there's a communications plan in place, you know, there are many, many templates out there as it relates to incident response. Um, once you put your plan in place, and um, you know, know who needs to be involved, it's also very important to test that plan. And uh, so that, you know, if it actually does happen, knock on wood, that, um, you know, you already know, um, you know, how to do it. You, uh, most people will test a, an incident response plan maybe uh, once a year. And, and that means that everybody gets around the table and, and to do a tabletop exercise, they know what they're supposed to do, they know how they're supposed to do it. And um, so that if it does happen, they're able to just, um, you know, basically go through it as, as quickly as possible to reduce the, the risk of harm for both the organization and their customers. And then finally, we have the rights request. And these are the areas that um, the Privacy Commissioner um, mentioned related to those individual rights. And remember, these are not just the you know, rights of our customers. These are our rights as well. You know, in, you know we are individuals living within this community, interacting with uh, various organizations as well. So, you know, these aren't just, you know, rights that are you know, out there for our customers and to drive us uh, a little bit crazy because it's something extra to do. These are rights that relate to us as well and how we relate to, you know, everybody that we give our personal information to. So again, um, you know, the right to request access to, to your information, to correct um, or delete information and then uh, to block use in, in certain situations. So the privacy commissioner mentioned, you know, what those, those rights were, but um, you know, what are the responses that we have to put in place as organizations? Well, we need to be ready to respond. If somebody asks for that information, we do have to be able to respond. Now, again, I, as I said earlier, um, you know, the, the person responding may actually be that the receptionist or the call center or, you know, indeed a cashier who's at the front desk who might receive the request. And in that case, they need to know who to who to send it to, you know, who is process, who is going to be processing that information within the organization. You know, it may be the privacy officer, it may be somebody who deals with customer service already, it may be um, you. And it's a matter of going into your, um, you know, your uh, CRM system and, you know, printing out that person's, um, the information on that particular customer and they highlight that their date of birth is incorrect and going back into that um, CRM system and, and correcting that information. Now, Section 20 of PIPA actually has um, more detail on specific things such as acknowledging requests in writing, the time period for responding to requests and such. And I would assume that, you know, there will probably be more specific guidance as um, we start looking towards the um, enactment of, of the full um, Personal Information Protection Act in the, the coming months from the Privacy Commissioner's Office, but it is important to ensure that whatever is done by the organization is within the time um, frames identified uh, within the Act, and then also, um, you know, ensuring that there is documentation so that if there are any issues, if the uh, individual does make a complaint to the Privacy Commissioner that the organization um, you know, does have have that information documented that there was a request, it was changed on such and such a date, et cetera. Um, so that due diligence is, is very key. So um, 
I did go over quite a bit of information. I do apologize if it, if it was quite a bit, but as I said, there is a lot of this information available in greater detail on the Privacy Commissioner's website at privacy.bm. And uh, I do encourage you to go into the guidance section. Um, the Privacy Commissioner's Office continually releases um, um, guidance. And I would assume, uh, as I said, as we go towards uh, the Privacy um, uh, Personal Information Protection Act coming into force uh, in the coming weeks and months, um, there will be additional guidance to ensure that you know we are ready for, you know, not only um, pipe uh, uh, preparations um, as we're doing through a uh, you know your um, your privacy uh, program uh, development plan, but then ultimately as we start you know getting into other parts of the the act as they come into force related to those individual access requests and um, what happens in the case of an incident response. But right now, hopefully this information will will help organizations get ready. Uh, for the act to to ultimately come into force so that you know what you have and you know what you need to do to be able to comply with the act. So uh, are there any questions? And uh, I will uh, do my best to uh, <laughs> to uh, respond to uh, some of the questions as, as um, the Privacy Commissioner said, he had to run off to a, another meeting, um, but there is also the ability to um, to also uh, send any e send emails to the privacy commissioner's office if there are any um, specific questions that the uh, that we need the privacy commissioner to answer. Okay, I'm going to and please excuse me. I'm trying to open up the questions on my my screen. Let me just see. Okay, I see we do have a few questions. Uh, the first one, how deep into the computer system would the business be required to erase data? Computers may retain information deeper within the system and may require an IT specialist, which may call financial strain. Um, that is a good question. and. Um, Boy, to, to answer that one, um, sadly, I'm going to say it depends. Uh, it depends on the type of information, and it also depends on um, where, where it is saved and um, how many iterations of that information you may find as well. So uh, what do I mean by how many iterations? Okay, we may be saving information, you know, on our system, and then, of course, we're going to be doing backups and and things like that, you know, for security purposes and such. And those backups may be, you know, done locally, um, you know, as a, uh, locally meaning uh, both within our organization and locally, uh, as in saved on the island. And you may also find that some people will do backups. Um, you know, using overseas third-party vendors and things like that. So if somebody were to request to have data erased, or indeed due to our data retention programs, and that is that is a key phrase that, um, you know, all size organizations need to be aware of. We need to know, um, you know, how long we should be keeping information and when we should be getting rid of it um, because just keeping information for information's sake creates a risk for us as well. So, you know, if you should be um, deleting and disposing of information um, after five years or whatever, you, you definitely don't want to be keeping it for longer than you need it. If somebody hacks into your system um, and gets access to absolutely everything, if you have information that should have been deleted, you know, that's more information that they they then have access to. So, so yes, uh, it means that you need to know where that information is. So, you know, there, there may be files that you have, there may be files that are saved with vendors, there may be files that may be backed up elsewhere. Uh, so the key thing is to, to try to get rid of those, um, those various iterations. 
Um, yes, it is understood that for some systems, it may take a bit longer to purge that information because of how things may be saved. Um, but you know that that needs to be some sort of an analysis may be take may take place during your privacy impact assessment. Um, if it is deemed that there is going to be you know, the cost to be able to delete some information that is very deep in the system is just prohibitive. Um, basically, um, I, I, I would say the way in which to deal with that is you have identified that risk. You have identified that, um, you know, there may still be um, information that is available, you know, if the um, computer is taken apart forensically or whatever that may be, and that um, some senior individual within the organization may want to sign off on that risk as being acceptable to them because all of the other iterations, everything else that has been identified, you know, has been deleted uh, or will be deleted. And, you know, that, that small risk that there's still some information remaining that may be available through a forensic search is still there. It has been recognized. It has been deemed as acceptable risk for the organization, and you know it has been signed off. So that may be one way to to deal with a situation uh, like that. Um, next question: If we have a database used to store client information, will we have to disclose the vendor's name that will hold the data that may be stored in the cloud? Uh, generally, yes. You should identify that the um, information will be stored um, via Amazon Web Services or, uh, you know, Google, Google Docs or, you know, whomever it may be. Um, the, in the interesting thing when you are using um, some of these third-party um, databases is that the, the good thing is that they do have very high levels of of security and access controls and such. I mean, granted, you know, they're, they're still at risk for, you know, uh, you know, being hacked and things like that, but sometimes they're actually, they actually have higher levels of security than, you know, often our organizations do, um, which is why we end up using them. So um, the thing is, if we are using those third-party systems, we do need to identify that, yes, we are using Amazon Web Services and, Indeed, we may also want to uh, say where, because um, there are some organizations that are going to be very keen on uh, jurisdictionally where their their information is stored because of concerns about um, national security access in jur certain jurisdictions and things like that. So, you know, say for example, you're using Amazon Web Services based out of Canada, uh, you you would want to communicate that, you know, it is, it is uh, um, you know, out of Canada because for, for some individuals that, that will be very important information. Um, Again, when when it comes to other vendors and such, um, you know, your, your credit card processing and things like that, um, you know, providing that that basic level of information that, you know, pro, uh, credit card processing, um, you know, will be through this third party vendor um, or, you know, you're, that you're using a particular vendor that is, um, you know, passing, um, passing your information through. Uh, to you know, say micro, uh, you know, a Microsoft um, um, database or something like that. You know, you you do want to to say where, who is able to basically see that information. And then let's see, we have an another one. We may. This is our last one. Um, thank you for informative presentation. Uh, and then they just say, can the slides from today be sent to participants? Uh, yes, the, the slides will be shared with the, uh, with the BEDC. Additionally, they have recorded this session. So the session will be made available to, to participants. So, um, you know, the, the, um, this, this whole session can be reviewed and, um, um, both uh, uh, on the video and then, of course, with the slides. 
So um, if there are any other questions, um, I'm happy to, to answer. Otherwise, um, please do send, uh, send emails, uh, whether to, to myself or to the Privacy Commissioner. Again, please visit uh, privacy.bm. There is a lot of, of um, guidance and information on privacy.bm. And uh, I've just put up the, the, um, the contact details for both the Privacy Commissioner's Office and uh, for, for myself. And um, if you do have um, any uh, specific questions as it relates to some of the guidance, if, there, if you do see that there are areas in which there is the desire or need for additional guidance, definitely um, you know, provide your thoughts and, and concerns to the Privacy Commissioner. He um, has been doing his uh, listening tour, and uh, a lot of the guidance that he is developing is due to uh, questions that are being asked within the community. Additionally, Bermuda is not the first one doing this. There has been data protection and privacy legislation in many other jurisdictions for, for many, many years. There are many uh, templates and tools out there to help organizations to prepare uh, to be able to um, uh, you know, get, uh, comply with uh, privacy requirements. And uh, a lot of uh, what is out there is still usable for Bermuda because of the fact that the Personal Information Protection Act was developed using international best practice. And, you know, therefore, you know, we didn't recreate the wheel in the creation of the act. And therefore, why recreate the wheel when, um, you know, developing and utilizing tools uh, and templates when there's so many already out there developed uh, by other jurisdictions. Um, in addition to the Privacy Commissioner's website, there are many other websites, the UK Private, uh, Information Commissioner's Office, uh, the Irish Data Protection Commissioner, um, the Canadian um, um, Information um, Commissioner's Office, and they do provide a lot of uh, templates and um, additional information that you may find beneficial um, in advance of additional uh, guidance that the Privacy Commissioner's Office may put out. So I don't see any more questions, so I'm going to say thank you very much. And uh, I do hope you have a great day. Thank you for your time. And uh, I hope that you did find this uh, uh, helpful.